Our topic today is student initiatives. We want you guys to get a feel for what's going on, not only at the UCLA campus, but what young people are doing across our state and just you know in our area to really make a difference. Um, that being said, Isis. Nice introduction, thanks. So I went over this last week, but a lot of you left, so really briefly, art, um, it's part of ESLP along with the lecture series and film series. And I won't go into any of the details, but basically you get graded upper division units for this, two units each quarter for a member, three units each quarter for a leader. And you should do it because whatever you choose to do, you make UCLA more sustainable. Um, you meet people, you meet um, chancellors and vice chancellors and people really high up there that can write you letters of recommendation and maybe job opportunities, you never know. Great for a resume. So we talked about having a meeting. A lot of you said um, you could do one, so that's great. So there'll be one tonight off campus at my apartment, um, 8 to 9 p.m., 520 Kelton, 403. Just give me a call if you can't get inside. Hopefully we'll see you there. If not tonight, please come out. Tomorrow after the E3 meeting, Rice 164, I was told E3 ends at like 6.30, so we'll start right after that. It probably won't take the whole hour, it's just so we can all talk and hash out some ideas. And if you guys can't do either of these, that's totally fine as well. We can always meet one-on-one -on -one, um, or after class or something, we can figure it out. So that's just to let you know, they're written up there as reminders. Um, any questions about art? I didn't get to ask that last time. Briefly questions. No. Okay. So then. Yeah. Um, we'll talk about all that tonight. There are some under works, and then also other ones that people might want to bring up tonight that they have ideas for. So we're looking for members and leaders. However much involvement you want. Also remember, Ichiro Nashimura came last week talking about the whole freezer armadillo sugar-coated DNA thing, which was really cool. If you don't know what I'm talking about, come to the meeting. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, did you have a question? Yeah, what's the time commitment like, like weekly? Um, so each unit, I don't know if you guys know this, but you're supposed to spend three hours of work for every unit. So for the team members, that's about six hours a week. For team leaders, that's about nine hours. And we hold about one or two meetings a week, and you meet with your group for an hour or however long, and then the rest of the time is spent actually doing the research. And then there's also a really short book that we'll read over the 20 weeks. It's like 100 pages, so that's 10 pages a day over 20 weeks. Um, so yeah, six to nine hours. Not that much for getting, you know, getting rid of a whole class. So today we have um, Sarah Lehman. Oh. It is, um, yeah, the Environmental Systems and Society minor, it just got added, so out of the five upper division classes, it'll count for one of them, which is great. And you get to hang out with all of us. <laughs> so hopefully I'll see you guys there. Can I just get a show of hands of people that might want to come tonight so I don't sit there by myself? Okay, cool, I'm excited. <laughs> so we have um, Sarah Lehman and her three lovely students coming from um, the Environmental Charter High Schools here in Los Angeles. They're from the Green Ambassadors program and they'll tell you all about that. So here's Sarah Lehman and then the students will speak to you. So I'm gonna start with a quote from one of my favorite eco heroes and it goes like this. Um, the greatest sin in the world is to believe that your food comes from a grocery store and your heat comes from a furnace. Who said it? Aldo, what did you say? Aldo. Yep, Aldo Leopold. Okay, so he's from Wisconsin. He's the father of ecology, and he's my hero because um, if you get that quote, you understand that we're so disconnected from our environment, um, and we're disconnected from where things come from. And I believe that systemically, if we can change to get people to understand they're connected to absolutely everything, then we'll actually have a changed world. And that's what I'm committed to, and that's what I'm committed to doing in all of schools. And the way that it's happening is through the Green Ambassador Program. And the Green Ambassador Program is a class, it's a curriculum, kind of, I guess kind of like this, where you're doing actions, is that correct? 
and you're doing things and you're learning how to be like an agent of change in your community. Um, and it also has different components like we go on green adventures, we go on, con we speak at conferences um, and pioneers. We're going to be speaking at Green Fest and you're going to hear all about this. And the students take on their own initiatives and they're going to talk about their initiatives that they take on. Um, so we're just working with, you know, so-called high school students. Um, but to tell you the truth, um, I mean, these three girls are just a small representative of what is happening in, I guess, the youth movement of um, teenagers. And I believe that these girls are responsible for recreating that story of what we um, deem to call teenagers. And we usually see them as disrespectful and not really caring and really apathetic. But um, they're redefining the story of a teenager. And it's awesome to be part of it. And I believe, like, today, waking up, I felt like I was in a dream. And that's basically my every day. Um, but now I feel like the dream can become more of a reality now. But I feel like working with these students, um, it's, it's living my dream. Um, I get to be part of their daily lives and see them grow. But I'm also taking this program across the nation, um, taking this curriculum into every charter school across the nation is pretty exciting to see. And they get to be part of it also. So today, they're going to be sharing their stories of um, who they are and what they're doing. Um, and of course, make it a dialogue, so interact with them, talk to them. I'm acting like they're animals or something, but like, um, I don't know. But like, I know, it's odd, talk to them or something. They won't bite. Um, but they're going to be sharing their stories. And um, if you have suggestions, if you have resources, and we'll also be sharing resources with you. I know we only have like 20 minutes, 30 minutes or so. So we'll be quick, but um, yeah, ask away, and um, at the end, I'll come back up for questions that you might have. And of course, um, Michael Silverman's here, and he came to our campus also, as in some of his students from his other classes. Um, our campus. How many heard of? How many people heard of Environmental Charter High School before? Oh, yay! Excellent. How many people heard of Green Ambassadors before? Yay! Same people. Okay, good. So, um, <laughs> how many people are not from LA? Just so I can see that. Oh, okay. That's important for me to know. I forget that you guys aren't from LA. Like, I feel if you're in LA. So um, they might be making terms of like things that you should know if you live in LA that we forget that people don't know that aren't from LA. So apologize and just kind of be aware of that also when you're speaking. All right, so um, I'm going to start off with Cindy. Um, Cindy Linares is going to be speaking. Um, Cindy was a green ambassador. Um, she took the class last year. Um, but. Right away when she started taking the class, she started taking initiative to make the classes happen. And part of the class is holding a project um, and holding an event that's educating people about sustainable issues. Um, and I always saw Cindy taking it a step above and beyond in the classes. Um, so she became an intern um, for me and for the Green Ambassador Program. And she's a community organizing intern. So that means that all the events that we have on our campus, she's organizing for our campus. And all the um, whenever we need people to show up somewhere, she helps organize it. And she takes on a lot of roles um, as being an intern um, and she's going to talk about her adventure to Costa Rica so everyone welcome Cindy hi everyone um, as Sarah said my name is Cindy I'm, I'm 16 years old and I'm a junior at environmental charter high school and um, so, like she said this summer, um, Green Ambassadors has this program, which is Green Adventures. And I went to Costa Rica, and it was the Caribbean side of Costa Rica. And basically, it introduced me to a whole different world, a whole different mind, a way of me thinking. And I learned about sustainability in a way that I had never learned before. And as I'm talking, I'm gonna, um, I'm going to pass this. Uh, it's. It's practically a scrapbook about Costa Rica and what we did over there, so I'm just going to be passing it around. <clears throat> so um, when I got to ECHS, I, I, it was, in, I was in the mind state of I don't care about anything. And it was, I was very, and now I can admit to this that I, um, I only thought about myself and I didn't care about anything else. And I got there and I, um, I had all these new things coming at me, and I didn't know what they were or what they were meant to me or how it affected everyone else. And I met Sarah, and, and she just got me involved in um, different projects that they were doing. And I was just there watching. I wasn't even involved. But by just watching, I, it inspired me to actually want to do something. So um, in the summer, we went to Costa Rica, the Caribbean side, and um, we stayed at it was the highlight of it for me was um, Punta Mona. We stayed at Punta Mona and we stayed at um, a permaculture farm. It was an all organic farm and um, 
and I just learned how to live a different way and still be happy with my lifestyle. Because, I don't know, here in Los Angeles, it's like, it's like cars and then TV, um, computers, and all of these things that we use and that it's like, it's a necessity for us. And in other countries, they don't need that. They're happy with just, um, with just what they have. And here, it's like, what we have, it, it's not a necessity, it's more of a want. And that's, that's the main thing I learned. It's the difference between wanting and needing. And um, what we learned over there is uh, there was this, this area of land, it was covered with bananas, like they were growing bananas. And I, I looked at it and one of our tour guides, Omar, he told us that that area was a home for, home for different people that were natives in Costa Rica. And that it was that all these people were evacuated from there and practically left homeless so that we here in the US can have bananas to eat. So that just impacted me so much. Like for me to eat one banana, like a family is homeless. And when I came back here, I I, I was speaking to students, to different people, and I was telling them, you know, like not I don't say don't eat dole or chiquita bananas. I say like stay away from Dole and Chiquita Bananas, and I tell them the reason for it, because the thing, like, you don't, now I think about it, and it's like, when I do something, or I'm going to do something, I think about what, how it's going to impact everything else, and not just me, and that is, like, the main focus of, the, one of the main focuses of Green Ambassadors is, like, don't just think about yourself, think ahead of it, and just think about how it's going to affect different people and different countries, should I say. So, but, um, so what I learned was the difference between wanting and needing, and how um, how the way that you live can impact somebody else's life, even if you don't even think about it. So at school, what I did, um, not necessarily I, but with the Green Ambassadors, we started a, a tr um, fruit forest at at our school. Um, it was, we moved to a new campus and it was very dull. It didn't have anything. So we created a fruit forest and we have over 60, plant, 60 plants and 60 um, fruit plants. And it, it also goes with the thing from Costa Rica about the bananas, like we're eating what we're growing in our own land and we're not taking anybody else's space or, impact, or changing anybody else's life in a harmful way. And um, we took on that project, and, and we also went out to the community and offered fruit trees to everyone else. And we told them the story behind like, why we're doing this and why, why if we do something and then we tell the community how they can keep telling people about it, and it'll just spread. Because if the youth gets involved now and we tell the community, the community will tell their kids and their kids will tell everybody else. And that's how things will spread, and that's how we impact people's life, and that's how this whole, you know, crisis that is going on, it's going gonna, it's gonna to change because if we don't communicate with other people, then nothing's going to change. And it also has to do not only with youth, but I mean, just other people that are, are uneducated about these things. They don't know about it, so they don't take action upon it. So by learning this and by being a Green Ambassadors, it, it made me think twice about everything that I do. And it, it just, you inspire people and people inspire you. So, yeah, so that's it. <laughs> Thank you. And one thing Cindy was um, referring to is the fruit trees and the food forest that we have on our campus. Um, that's what we want to have happen in every campus and have all kids be connected to their food again. And the organizations that we work with with that is the Fruit Tree Planting Foundation and Common Vision. Um, they plant in any nonprofit around the world and Common Fruit, Fruit, Fruit Tree Planting Foundation give you up to $10,000 in in-kind donations um, for those trees. And then we also um, worked with Common Vision. Has anyone ever heard of Common Vision before? Okay, so Common Vision is an amazing organization. You should be part of it. You should know about them. They, they're going to come here in March, and they plant fruit trees um, from Santa Barbara all the way up to the Bay Area um, in March, and they go on a tour for 10 weeks. They're always looking for people to go on tour with them, so you want to take a semester off. And, um, and they go to um, schools every single day, sometimes two schools a day, and they do theatrical performances. They plant trees. They do um, drum and rap workshops and things like that um, to get kids connected to it. Um, so next we're going to have Genesis. Um, and Genesis um, was a student that came second semester, right, last year. Um, and environmental charter high school, yeah, you think, okay, where all these like hippies are, right? And uh, 
I don't even consider myself a hippie, but um, I'm probably the hippiest of the hippies that are there. And, um, but the students aren't coming there because they're hippies, and they're not coming there because they are um, wanting to change the world, per se, when they start. Um, by the time they leave, they do. Within a, probably a couple months, they want to start changing the world. And um, in the Green Ambassador course, we ask the students, if you don't want to change the world, you can leave the classroom. Then don't be here, because we're here to like change the world. And especially now is our time to act into that change. So um, Genesis arrived in our campus, and she is um, obviously incredibly intelligent when you hear her speak, but um, she was like kind of thrown off by what the heck is going on here at the school, and I've never seen anything like this. And now she's taking it full on, and she's also a Green Ambassador um, intern. And she takes on lots of things as an intern, which she's going to talk about. Um, and she's taking, sometimes I can trust her more than I can trust paid employees to get projects done um, and to take them to the next level. And um, I'm just really honored to introduce to you Genesis. <laughs> Hello, well, my name is Genesis, and I'm 16 years old, and I go to Environmental Charter High School. And the minute I walked through the gate of Environmental Charter High School, um, I felt as if someone took the blindfold off my eyes. It was like, we all knew about global warming and all these different things, but it was just the surface. People were just scra scratching the surface, and we didn't really know what, what could we do about it or what, what was really all about. So Green Ambassadors inspired me to make a difference in the world. I started looking more into it, and I realized that um, that it doesn't matter how small the effort you make, you you can always make a difference. Um, I actually took the Green Ambassadors class um, second last semester. Yeah, okay, yeah. I took it and I came in, and I didn't really know what it was about, and I started learning about um, biodiesel. We started teaching other kids about sustainability and other things, and I started getting really interested, and I said, hey, you know, give it a try. So when I came as an 11th grader, I talked to Ms. Lehman, and I wanted to start working with her. So I became her intern, and we pretty, yeah, I pretty much started working with her, and I'm working in different projects right now. One of my projects was the waste management in our school. We have six different compo no, waste stations, comp one for compost, landfill, and recycling. And I knew, people knew how to use them to their own way, I guess you can say. Like, they didn't know how to use them properly. They knew what it was, but they didn't know what, what could be composted. For example, some people thought that just any kind of food could be composted, and they didn't know that dairy couldn't be composted and certain things like that. So I created this program in which we use the 10th graders of the Green Ambassador class to stand, to be kind of like trash goalies and stand at their waste stations. <laughs> <laughs> and they pretty much have to teach others, like when someone comes and throws their trash away, they have to teach others, like, okay, the compost goes here, recycling goes here, and landfill goes here, because a lot of people don't know what they're doing. So right now, that's what I'm doing, and I also, I thought of a different idea, a new idea, and that was my, the, to start a, to have a recycle fashion show which is pretty much make a fashion show out of recycled clothes to show that fashion can be green too. So pretty much we're using clothes such as like from vintage clothing stores and used clothing stores such as Jet Rag and different things. And we're using them to create this whole fashion show to prove that being you know, being fashionable doesn't always, you don't always have to use all these new resources or products, you know, you, you can always reuse clothing, you can make something out of pretty much anything. <laughs> so yeah, and then that's what we're doing, and pretty much, well, yeah, that's pretty much it. And I'm really looking forward to working more into it and, you know, being a leader to others and inspire others. <laughs> And one thing Genesis is doing is with the Recycle Fashion Show, she wants to do it so that it's appealing to uh, 
to, to students. Because sometimes like the green message and sometimes any message can be quite daunting and boring, you know. Um, but she's making sure that it's inspiring and that um, through fashion, trying to get other people inspired and spreading the green uh, message through that. We did something like that last year, um, which Jordan Howard was part of. So you're going to meet Jordan in just a second. Um, but another thing that Cindy men mentioned um, about the green adventures, one thing that we do is we went with Costa Rican adventures. If you guys are looking for a trip, and Punta Mona always takes interns, just so you know, um, over the summer where you can live in basically the middle of paradise and have all food provided for you. And you live on an organic farm and all the food is grown there. Um, it's permaculturally based, meaning that it's the design is within nature. And um, I highly recommend checking out Punta Mona or any like other sustainable farms in Costa Rica. You just basically have to afford your plane flight down there and that's about it and you can we found our plane flights for like $220 um, last year pretty tight deal um, this year it looks like we're going to be going with global exchange just so you know that name if you don't know global exchange look them up they work with fair trade um, and they're um, based in San Francisco um, and we're going to be going with them um, they take reality tours across the entire world um, one reality tour that the students really want is something with food um, something with Mexico and something with um, fair trade to see what that looks like and what it looks like across the border so we're, it looks like we're going to Chiapas in Mexico um, so you can definitely join us number one number two um, take a look at global exchange to look at their amazing programs so um, lastly we're going to hear from Jordan Howard um, She's going to kind of give her story of how she ended up in the Green Ambassador Program. And at first, um, I saw huge potential in Jordan because she is a, um, who's ever read The Tipping Point? OK, so good. Um, read it if you haven't. Um, everyone needs to know it. It's about how social change happens and the levels of, and the people that are part of social change. And one of the people part of the social change is the salesman, right? You have to have someone to sell the idea once the idea has been um, you know, created. Um, you have the mavens and you have the, what else? Connectors. OK. So you have three people, Maven, Connectors, and Salesman. Um, Jordan Howard's definitely a salesman. She used to sell things. She would go around and she would sell toothbrushes. And she would sell, um, what else did she sell? Can you give me something else? Bananas. We had bananas one day left over from, school, from her school lunch, right? So she goes around, she's selling bananas and making a banana cheer. Um, to forget to get everyone to buy bananas and people bought all the bananas and she earned all this money I'm like who is this girl right she's crazy so um, she thinks I'm crazy but um, literally Green Ambassadors would not be what it's at right now if it wasn't for Jordan Howard um, she spoke with um, Hillary Clinton um, for an Obama fundraiser about four weeks maybe longer than that I don't know time is irrelevant but she's um, she traveled to Bioneers and she spoke in San Francisco at Bioneers one of the largest um, conferences she's speaking at Green Fest in San Francisco she's going to be featured in um, Girls Gone Green which is a book um, <laughs> yes I know <laughs> um, she's a girl gone green and um, and green's the new black right or something like that okay so um, she's featured in that book, and she also was last week Tuesday. If you caught, um, if you have Discovery Green or Planet Green, Planet Green, um, she was featured along with um, Cindy was on there also um, on a TV program um, called Alter Eco with uh, Ego, Eco, yeah, with Adrian Granera or how are you say his last name, the guy from Entourage. Um, so she was featured on that episode. So obviously she's doing things and she's creating great change. And everyone looks up to Jordan Howard in our school in terms of like, okay, how do you do it, you know? Um, and it's really great um, to have that. And like with all of my interns, I have a very great relationship where I don't know, we're texting each other during the whole election and things like that, you know, to make sure we're keeping up on what's going on. And it's really great to be part, like I said, of change. And Jordan could practically run um, Green Ambassadors right now and it could exist without me, thank goodness. So, um, so without further ado, now she has a lot to live up to. I apologize. Without further ado, um, welcome Jordan Howard. Before I start, could I have everyone talk to their partner and ask the question, what does it mean to be green?
Is everyone done? <laughs> Can I get someone to share? Someone? Anyone? Anyone else? <laughs> Not that it was wrong, just anyone else? <laughs> Okay, I'm gonna tell you what it means, what I think it means to be green throughout my whole story. So, just like Layman said before, like coming to Environmental Charter High School as a freshman, the first class we had to take was environmental science. And my teacher, she used to talk about global warming and how it's important to recycle. She taught us what composting is. And no one in the class was really interested, but I was always the student that said, hey, like this is, this is not important. Why are we learning this? Why are we learning this? And I always questioned her. I remember going to the Bologna wetlands and getting in trouble because I was arguing with the guy, telling him that we didn't need the wetlands, that we needed to build homes. <laughs> and, and now, I guess, my peers see me today and they're like, whoa, what's up with you? You're talking about a compostable cup before you wanted to throw a compostable cup at the teacher. <laughs> but I met Sarah when I was trying to sell her a toothbrush. It was a green toothbrush. And I'm like, hey, 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 here, I have a green toothbrush. It, go with, it goes with your eyes. And she's like, okay, you like selling? So I'm gonna give you something to sell. And she gave me binders and pencils, <laughs> sustainable binders and pencils. So I ran around, sold them and like, 30 minutes, <laughs> and she's like, whoa, I, I, need you, I need you more involved, I need you more involved. The next trip that the Green Ambassadors was going on was Bioneers. I still wasn't, wasn't interested in the, the Green Ambassadors. I was in the Green Ambassador class for about a month then, but I was selected to go on the trip because my teachers thought that I had leadership skills, and I guess they want, I thought they wanted to brainwash me. I remember going. <laughs> We had goals and we would always talk about our goals and what we wanted to come back with. And she always told us, you guys are gonna change, watch. You're gonna come back and see the world differently. And I was just like, yo, whatever. Like one weekend, I'm not gonna change. Going to Bioneers, it, it changed me. She was, she was right, she was right. I saw, I was inspired by solutions because before in ninth grade, we just learned about global warming and how the sea levels are gonna rise, it's gonna get really, really hot, we're gonna lose the biodiversity with animals, but she never told us, here's um, solutions. She never said, here's how the sea levels won't rise, do this, do that. It was just like, oh, we're all gonna die. And it's just like, wait, what? Like, and I always thought, the, I was always resistant to the green movement, even coming to the school, because it always seemed like I had to jump into extremes to be green. I couldn't eat meat. I had to just change my whole lifestyle. But when I learned that I can drink out of co a compostable cup, a corn-based cup, corn-based bags, when I learned that I didn't have to walk out the grocery store with all the groceries in my hand, I could use a reusable bag, it, was, it inspired me. And still, after coming, um, coming back after Bioneers, I was still a little resistant. I was, I guess, I was resistant to the change. I didn't want to change at all. But being in the Green Ambassador class even more, it made me think like, wow, um, when I would go home and tell my mom, hey mom, look, look, this bag is made out of corn. It can compost. And she's like, what? That looks like plastic. And they, when I talked to my friends from other high schools, they were like, plastic, why is plastic bad? And I'm like, what, you don't know? Why don't you know? But I forgot that I didn't know before. 80% of the things that I learned in the Green Ambassadors class, I didn't know. So I saw it as my job to educate other people, my family and my friends. So the first people I tried to change was my family. I went home, they told me I was brainwashed, whatever, go, go back to school with that. The first project I was involved with Green Ambassadors was Green Ambassador Productions. Um, Green Ambassador Productions had a film crew, fashion crew, acting crew, and dance crew, where we wanted to um, give, it was basically trying to get students involved that wouldn't, be, that wouldn't want to spread an environmental movement, but saying, hey, you like dancing, you like acting, you like creating films, let's go create change while we're doing that though. And I was a part of the film crew. I ended up directing the film. It was, it's a 12 minute film that shows simple changes people of all ages can make in their homes. Basically, we take you through the family of, a family of four, and for example, they wake up and they're taking a shower. The boy is taking a long shower. We rewind and show you how you can take a short shower. 
we wanted to we wanted to be solution based because have you ever seen a movie where you're inspired you're inspired you go home and you're like oh my god oh my god but you don't know what to do <laughs> so we wanted to show you what you can do right after and we ended up taking a film to seven different venues in L in L A and one being the LA Convention Center. We took it to a lot of Green Expos. We played it at our school. Everyone saw it at our school. And right now, we're, it's on YouTube. And we're trying to, I'm trying to get my other family members to look at it, look at it, look at it, trying to get them to learn. And that was the first project I've done with Green Ambassadors. After the film, I think while we're doing the film, it was more of a learning process for all of us. Even though I directed the film, I wasn't doing everything, every green solution in the film. And after directing it and seeing people's responses, like, oh my gosh, that inspired me, even my own family members. They're like, okay, like, Jordan, I don't use styrofoam anymore. I don't use styrofoam anymore. And I'm like, wow, well, I guess I need to start changing. So I use, I use the film for my life just to say, okay, look, I need to do one, every one of those green solutions. Like, I can't be saying, oh, look, I directed this film. I direct, and I only go by two of the solutions. And so it was, it was a learning process for all of us because the producers, the executive producer of the film, she was just like, whoa, I'm learning a lot too. Um, the writers of the film, we were, like, we were all learning. It was a learning process for everyone, again. And the second, I wanted to hit my family now. I've th I think that first we need to change in ourselves and then reach the closest people to us. So I wanted to go home and make my family green before they were resistant, but I wasn't gonna quit. My mom was pregnant unexpectedly and <laughs> and <laughs> yeah, yeah, she's married, but like, yeah, she's my, no, never mind. <laughs> so she was having a baby. And I remember reading a magazine and it was a green baby shower. And I'm like, mom, oh my God, we can have a green baby shower. Let's have a green baby shower. She's like, okay, yeah, we can have a green baby shower. Months go by, the baby shower is coming close. And I'm like, okay, are we gonna do it? Are we gonna do it, green baby shower? She's like, yeah, we can do it. We ended up having a green baby shower. It was probably one of the hardest things ever because I, they wanted to have the green baby shower, but I always had to check up, make sure, oh no, that's plastic, we can't have that. Like, and they didn't understand that you can't put green on something and not be green all the way through. And we had compostable flatware, organic and locally grown food. We asked everyone to bring their gifts, either in something the baby could reuse, like some people bought gifts in a cloth diaper, some people wrapped it in a towel, and, or we asked them just don't bring a, a bag at all, just bring the gift. Some people listened and some didn't, but every, I still get responses of people asking me, where did you get this from? Where did you get that from? And a lot of people didn't know that they were drinking out of a corn-based cup. They didn't know it was a sugar cane plate. They didn't know it was organic food. And they're just like, and I had signs everywhere because I wasn't gonna go around and be like, hey, you know, look what you're drinking out of, look what you're drinking out of. But after, um, like I said, I still get responses. People are like, hey, look, I, I buy corn-based cups now. I buy corn-based cups now. And then next, I, I went to Costa Rica with the Green Ambassadors. That was awesome. <laughs> and going back to before I went to the Bioneers Conference, the Bioneers Conference was, it was, the starting of, it was the start of a new life for me. So this year, I wanted to head it up for the rest of my classmates. I wanted everyone to have, to be inspired like I was because since I was inspired by, um, at Bioneers last year, Around this time last year, I've had so many opportunities, people calling me saying crazy stuff like, hey, I want to interview you and put you on a book. And I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> That's random. And I wanted my classmates to be inspired because now people look at me and they're like, wow, like, how did you change? And I look at myself and I'm like, whoa, how did I change? I, I didn't want to be green. I thought it was weird. I thought it was crazy. But when I see that it is easy being green, I want to teach other people. And I think that more, the most important part is that I do want to teach other people. I just don't want to keep it to myself and be my little green little Jordan and not tell this other person, hey, this is how you can be green. So, yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm not done. Yeah, I'm not done. Can I finish? Yeah, I'm not done. <laughs> going back to, <laughs> going back to Bioneers, I don't, I don't know, going back to Bioneers, 
I wanted to head it up for the rest of my classmates. So I went to Sarah and I was just like, okay, I want to put Bioneers on for everyone. Bioneers is one of the biggest environmental conferences in the world. And I was also chosen to speak to represent the Green Ambassadors on a panel with other youth from other organizations like Kids vs. Global Warming and Roots and Shoots. And I put the whole trip together for everyone, the com accommodations, the food we ate. Um, I made sure everyone was on board. And my whole goal was, even though I spoke at the conference and that was big, my whole goal was for my classmates to be inspired. I wanted them, like, it was a burnt mission to me if, if all of them come back and they're not doing anything right now. What are they doing? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that, that was my main goal. And right now I'm working on Green Festival. And um, it's, it's going to be in San Francisco. It's in Washington. They do one in Washington, D.C., San Francisco, Seattle, and someplace else in Chicago. So we're going up there next week. And I'm also presenting with, my, um, with one of my classmates, with one of the Green Ambassadors. And I've headed up the Green Fest trip. And this is my first time going to Green Fest, but I'm excited. And that's all. <laughs> So this is my reality. Every single day I get inspired. And sometimes when I'm like, oh my gosh, I don't want to move on. And then I, I get to work with um, these inspiring, inspiring teenagers. Um, and basically, I mean, we're going to finish up. It's time, correct? Yeah. So I think we probably went over. But um, I just want to be here to make sure that you're inspired, to understand that you guys can make change and that you guys can't keep it with you and that you guys can, whatever you can think up in your head, it can become a reality. Like, the Green Ambassadors are just a thought in my brain. And I was like, I was sick and tired of sitting in, um, you know, and having people tell me what to do. Um, and I left for, in, when I was in college, and I left for Africa because I'm like, screw this, I'm not gonna be part of this university system, this is BS, right? So I left and I went to Africa and I understood all these interconnections that we need to be part of. And I saw how interconnected we were to the world and the only way things are gonna change is if we make sure that people are connected and to make sure that it's starting when they're youth because it's the only way that it's actually gonna systemically change. And that's what for the last 10 years of my life, after I finished my college degree, obviously, I didn't think it was too much of a, of a bad system, but um, it's been my goal to make sure that this is happening. Um, and it was just a thought in my head of making green ambassadors, and here you can see a result of just one of my thoughts. And all, we can, if we can all think really positively, if we all can think of something to change the world, we can actually do it. And now we have to be those agents of change that, um, regardless if you like our new president or not, you know, but we have to be that agent of change that he's been talking about for the last years that he's been speaking. And um, I'm ready, you know, and I hope you guys are ready too. And if you need ideas, talk to these guys here, talk to me, come to Environmental Charter High School, be a green mentor, um, and just start living it in your life, be the change that you wish to see, and then um, change those around you, and then We've got to change the world. So thank you so much for having us here. And what? So like one question for any of these lovely girls. Does anybody have a question? Evan? Um, do you know when the application deadline is for UCLA? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's what, December 1st, and you all have to apply. You guys are only juniors, though, right? Okay, so for the next um, 15 minutes or so, we're going to have a couple different student groups talk to you about their different initiatives, maybe some people you haven't heard of, ways to get involved, their meeting times and such, and then we're going to have Matthew Kahn come in and talk about environmental economics f at 4 o'clock. So, Luch, do you want to introduce whoever? Yeah, can you set up this yeah. PowerPoint? Um, yeah, like... Thank you. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, like Isis was saying, we wanted to um, bring it back home a little bit and just uh, get a few of the many student groups we have on campus um, just to talk. We would have to have like every class probably filled with them if we wanted to get all of them in. So um, is this thing working? Hello? Yeah? yeah. 
All right. Um, <laughs> but I think it's definitely a testament to like UCLA and like you know our our activism that that we have so many groups and and Evan is you're like the president or what are you? You're and no no you're you're the for the net impact. Oh uh, yeah, I'm the co-president. Co-president of net impact as long as well as internal vice president. So come up here, Evan. Okay, so uh, I'll make this pretty short so that the other groups have time to present as well. Um, as you can see, this is leftover from an info session we had last Wednesday uh, after ESLP. Um, but yeah, so I'm part of Net Impact Undergrad, which is a local chapter of a national slash international organization of Net Impact. Um, and those are some of the people involved. Uh, it's a global membership organization, so um, they have a lot of chapters around the world, uh, as well as within uh, the U.S. Um, their central office is located in San Francisco, um, and the main thing to note from all this is that they are a network of people committed to making change through business. And so that's kind of the angle of sustainability that I'm going to be talking about today. Um, just a couple of notes on the timeline. Uh, it was founded in 1993 uh, by some MBA students who started it as Students for Responsible Business. And from there, it kind of evolved into um, net impact at various business schools around um, the country and around the world. And finally, in 2007, uh, they launched their undergraduate chapter because they saw that, you know, if we really want to be serious about making change um, with through business, we can't just start at the business schools, we have to start at the undergraduate level um, with curriculum change and getting undergraduates involved in this idea that business doesn't have to be completely separate from this idea of changing the world. Um, so as you can see, we're still pretty new, uh, about 4% of the total network, but um, we do have access to a lot of the faculty that are involved with this, a lot of the MBA students, our own uh, Anderson School has a net impact chapter um, and we communicate with the MBAs over there to help us on some of the projects which I'll talk to you all a little bit about. Um, but, but, so there's some of the universities that are involved. Um, so, and these are for the undergraduate chapters. Um, again, and it's, it's this kind of new burgeoning field of um, social business, as I like to refer to it. So, okay, so what's the structure of Net Impact Undergrad at UCLA, if you're interested in getting involved? Um, we, we just started in the spring, so we do have a lot of openings, and uh, at our general info session, info session, which um, I think some of the people who are in ESLP attended, um, they definitely had a chance to get plugged in, and it's not like we're filling up anytime soon. So there's a lot of ways to get involved, and I will start touching on that. But just to, again, kind of highlight um, where Net Impact Undergrad kind of sits on campus, or just in society in general, there seems to be this kind of like exclusivity, mutual exclusivity between the business and the business sphere realm and the environment and society uh, realm and sphere. Um, and net impact kind of fills that gap because for the longest time there's been business, 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 we want to make money, we want to innovate, we want to build all these things. And the environment and society type groups that seem to say, no, it can't all just be for you and we need to focus on all these other things. And net impact seeks to kind of bridge that gap. So then Net Impact Undergrad comes in, that's us at UCLA, and as you can see, uh, we have a bunch of business groups on campus. Some of you might be familiar with some of them, like uh, Undergraduate Business Society, Bruin Consulting, um, and then our own favorites on the right over there, uh, E3, International Social Justice Network, FEED, which is the like renewable energy, um, and I think it's Forum for Energy and Economic, energy and economic Development. Um, and they publish reports on like how renewable energy can be used to, you know, not screw over the economy, but in fact improve it. Um, CalPerg and a bunch of nonprofits, and we really seek to kind of be the communication between both these groups, as well as kind of that that center point between them. So working on issues that, you know, the business groups care about. It's okay to be passionate about business if that's what you're interested in, but why don't you try applying those skills that are really useful to a environmental or societal problem? Um, and it's definitely okay to be passionate about the environment and society, but what are some skills or tools that you can build to more effectively address those problems and possibly using business solutions for them? Um, so this is kind of what our group looks like. We have the executive board, uh, committee members, and general members. And as you can see, executive board are still committee members and general members, and committee members are still general members. members. So we're all general members, and what is the main role? And here's kind of where we're looking to grab students from who would be interested in being a part of this. Um, 
but the general uh, structure focuses on committees, and here's where everyone here can get involved. Um, so there's some central inif initiatives from that San Francisco office. Uh, these include a campus greening uh, initiative, um, which probably most of you would be interested in. Nonprofit capacity building. So this is like using business skills, like consulting and management skills, to improve the way nonprofits work. So whether that's helping them get funding, whether that's helping them improve the programs that help them to meet their mission. Um, we're looking to right now work with CalPerg on doing some like cost benefit analysis to help drop down textbook prices. Um, professional development, curriculum change. That's like you know a couple years ago. Uh, I think they advocated for like a business minor. And that's great, okay, so now UCLA is working on a business minor, but why not a social business minor or a social entrepreneurship minor? Why does it have to be just business? How can we help change the academics here just like ESLP does um, with what we can learn at UCLA? Um, and then here's some of the other ones that we've come up with as a local chapter to kind of address local issues. This includes uh, social ventures or social entrepreneurship, um, working with um, institutions that are for-profit, non-profit, maybe hybrids of the two, looking to advance a social mission through a business type model. Microfinance, if any of you have heard of the Grameen Bank or uh, Muhammad Yunus, and kind of making microloans, so instead of you know, thousands of dollars, it's $25 to a developing entrepreneur in a developing country, which can help them to start their business and um, develop their community. Um, and we're working with Kiva on that one, kiva.org. And socially responsible investing, this is a big one. This is probably also where um, a lot of you might want to be involved. Um, in the house, we have some people who are working on that. I know Elisa is and Victor. And are you guys going to be talking about that separately? Or? Um, but they're here, and, and you can talk to them. And I'm sure that's not even everyone involved with that that's in this room. But uh, socially responsible investing is that same idea of um, when you go to the store and you want to buy something, you have an option of buying, uh, you know, killing the world global warming type product or green sustainable product and you dollar vote. So where you put your money helps tell the companies that this is what I value and this is what I want to buy. And it's taking that concept and applying it to an investment type business role which is uh, the UCLA endowment. So right now UCLA has money that they invest in companies and not all these companies are, how shall we say it, socially responsible or um, beneficial to the environment. Um, and so what this co uh, committee or campaign, it's, um, we're kind of doing this in collaboration with the Responsible Endowment Campaign or Coalition, um, which is also working with USAC and President Hamira uh, Hosseini's office. Um, we're looking to get UCLA to say, okay, if you really want to commit yourself to social and environmental causes, then why don't you look at what you're dollar voting and where you're investing your endowment. So try and have some policies in there where you're not just going to invest to make the most money, but Yes, you're still looking at the financial sustainability of UCLA, but also what can we do to make sure that all this money that UCLA has, all this leverage that UCLA has, is going to sustainable, green, and socially conscious companies um, whenever possible. Um, so each committee is going to kind of work on you know, recruiting new people, letting people know that business isn't just about uh, you know, meeting the single bottom line, but looking at triple bottom line type stuff, and kind of informing the UCLA campus about that. Um, and again, here's kind of the things that we're looking at working on. So um, how much time do I have? Okay, 20 seconds, cool. Um, so basically, if you want to get involved, you can contact us at netimpact.ucla at gmail.com. And you can also look for us on Facebook. Or you can talk to Victor or Elisa, I know, who are both working on the Responsible Endowments Campaign if you want to throw some volunteer help in talking with administrators about getting us to change our investment policy. Um, and on the Campus Greening Initiative, um, that's as open right now because that kind of like one event or one action or one case study that that committee is going to be working on isn't exactly solidified yet. Um, we're looking in kind of doing a joint collaboration um, working on some housing projects on campus. So in other words, um, how can we have students who live sustainably benefit from their lower costs of water and energy use? Um, how can they benefit from that in terms of lowering the cost of their housing fee? Um, so that's probably how that committee is going to go out yet, but it is open. And again, if you're interested, just email us. Um, we have a speaker series, or a speaker next week. Uh, he spoke at ESLP last spring. Uh, from the Anderson School. I always forget his last name. Corbett. There you go. Uh, all, you all know him. OK. Um, and that'll be in the uh, Kirkhoff Grand Salon room around noon, so like a lunchtime type event. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for your time. Sorry, it was a little bit over. Awesome, Evan. Uh, yeah. 
I just want to say that um, for arts, I mean, that could be a really cool art project as well if any of you guys were thinking that right. Like, there's all these routes you can go. So just keep it in your mind. All right. Um, did you put contact? Oh, yeah. Um, so that you can get involved if you guys want to get involved in that impact. And then I'd like to welcome Elisa up here. And she's going to talk a little bit about E3 um, and TJF. So. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, I hate using microphones. Hi, I'm Elise. I'm a Dean. I'm a member of E3, and um, I don't have a fancy PowerPoint like Evan does, so hopefully I can make do with just my voice. But um, E3 is a student group on campus. It stands for Ecology, Economy, Equity. So kind of like looking at that triple bottom line of how environmental work and social justice come together and how they're definitely interrelated and most of the time, same. Um, so E3 has been um, around on campus for a while. It started about six years ago and ESLP is actually, um, used to be a campaign of E3, it's still some ways interrelated, but that um, was born out of E3 and we're um, the UCLA chapter of the California Student Sustainability Coalition. So um, we're part of a um, statewide network of UCs, CSUs, community colleges. So um, we get to share information, hear about other campaigns, and kind of um, work off that structure. Um, we actually went to Convergence last weekend, two weekends ago, in San Francisco. So that was really great. Who went to that? Yay. It's pretty fun. And um, we're going to go to another one in the spring if you're interested. Free food. Everything's free. It's just amazing. You get to go to um, great workshops. And that's one of the things that we do. Um, other things that we do, um, we have a Waste Watchers campaign that we're looking to take to the next level this year. Basically, um, we started it two years ago monitoring um, student food waste in the dining halls. And this year, we'd like to take it up a notch and um, get um, some get a green consulting company to monitor the carbon footprint of a lot of the meals in the dining hall so that we can kind of actually see what our impact is. And um, doing it more regularly in more dining halls, educating students about how much they really waste and um, what that means in terms of um, environmental impact. And also getting the students that get in trouble in the dorms um, to do that from community service, something we're looking at. So if you're interested in that, um, definitely come to our meetings. We're going to be talking about that soon. Um, what else do we do? We also have an organic garden up at Sunset, and um, we're getting that started again this year. That's one of our um, upcoming activities this Saturday. I'll write that on the board. Um, it's up at Sunset Rec, so if you're interested in gardening, sustainable gardening, composting, um, we've got that going. And um, actually, right now, um, we're kind of at this place where we're getting, um, we have room for a lot of new leadership, and um, we're kind of um, trying to decide one of our um, year-long campaigns right now. Um, I'll segue this into TGIF. Last year, our um, campaign, uh, one of our major campaigns was TGIF. Um, that stands for the Green Initiative Fund. How many people know about TGIF already? Kind of. All right, so not much explanation needed. Basically, um, if you don't know, TGIF, the Green Initiative Fund, is um, a student referendum we um, passed by 76% last spring. Pretty amazing. Uh, it raises about $200,000 a year for student-led sustainability projects. That means all of you here that are now inspired and have great ideas for what you want to do on campus or in the LA community for sustainability can apply for um, money to fund those projects. And um, great news is we'll probably be starting that up in January. So if you have something that's like you're itching to get going, you'll probably get to um, get that going. So I guess that was my TJF explanation. But um, just so you know, probably January we'll get that going. Um, we're starting to have meetings of that committee. So um, in a nutshell, that's kind of you through where we're at. We have meetings every Thursday night. Uh, or every other Thursday, we have our steering committee, which is kind of like a leadership meeting open to everyone um, every other Thursday. So right now, our general meetings are um, on odd weeks, 5 to 7, or 5 to 6.30 in Royce 164. We're kind of using that room until we can find a better one next quarter. But um, next week, I'd like to invite you guys all um, you guys all to our potluck. We're going to have a potluck. The location is kind of TBD right now. Um, and it's basically a place where we can all come, bring some great food, and um, discuss ideas, discuss what we want to work on. And um, I think we're going to hopefully have an art project going on for the garden next week. Um, so I'd like all of you guys to come. Just bring something if you can. Bring utensils, and um, it'll be a good time. So I'm going to write all this info on how to um, get involved in E3 on the board, because we don't really make flyers that often. So um, if you'd like to be added to our email list, we send out a ton of info about what we're doing. Um, one of our campaigns right now, too, is the Responsible Investing Campaign, which Evan briefly mentioned. Um, 
So come if you want to get involved in that too. We have speakers. We have a good time. Um, just email the email address I'm going to put up there, e3.info at gmail. And um, we'll put you on our email list. We try not to spam. We only email about once a week. And um, I'll put up the info about the potluck and the garden workday this um, Saturday, 2 to 4, up there too. Any questions? Yeah, it's e3.info at gmail.com. But I'll, yeah, he's got it. And I'm just going to write up the potluck time and um, our meeting place and the garden workday info if you want to go. But just email that in, um, email for anything. I get them. So <laughs> I'll respond to it pretty quickly. Thanks, Elisa. Um, just like real quick before we, before we move on, uh, to kind of like expand on what Elisa was talking about um, with regards to CSSC, I thought I'd uh, just talk a little bit briefly about that because if it wasn't for that, like we wouldn't be here. So, um, and that basically started back in 2003 with the uh, Greenpeace program called UC Go Solar. They're trying to get the UCs to be more, um, use more renewable energies. And even after they left, all the students that were involved like were so passionate about it that they created this statewide, you know, coalition. And you know, E3 was created at the same time. So, but the thing that's really, uh, that, that's really cool that that um, I really like about it is like the coalitional support. So we're talking about you know having these different campaigns working with Net Impact or working with other organizations. And so, you know, I just wanted to emphasize that basically I think the, the, the real strength of the organization and its success has been founded in like social networking and just basically like centered around like creating community and like creating that kind of like that spirit of like unity. And then also with like working with administrators instead of against them. So you know, and then, you know, Lisa kind of talked about that a little bit. So, you know, it's just all about trying to work towards uh, fixing, you know, and, and creating solutions instead of making other people into like, well, you guys are the problem. Um, so, given that, I'd like to welcome our brand new sustainability coordinator down. Um, her name is Nareet Katz, and it's the first time that the UCLA has a sustainability coordinator. Um, UC Santa Cruz has one, and UC Santa Barbara and Berkeley, I think. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, we're very proud to have Nareet. Uh, it's a real honor to have her in class today, too. Thanks. So here you go. Thank you. Yay. So it sounds like most of you guys are already involved at some level or another. Everyone knew about TJF. How many of you are in E3 or some other group already? Like pretty much everybody. OK. Well. You know, as you heard today, there's a lot of different ways for students to get involved um, in sustainability on campus. I am now the sustainability coordinator, but just a few months ago, I was a graduate student. Um, I just finished up in public policy in the MBA program here. Um, and so it was my involvement as a student that led to, you know, where I'm now going with my career and everything and involvement as staff now. I still feel weird about that hat. They ask me when I go to ASUCLA, you know, are you a student every time you get something? And, I still say yes half the time because I forget. But um, anyway, there's, you know, sustainability, as people have talked about already today, is, is a really big and broad issue. Um, and there's a lot of different ways to get involved that are about the community and about global issues. But there's also a lot that we can do here on campus. And you may have already heard about some of the campus sustainability initiatives in energy and transportation and housing. Um, so if you guys are interested in that kind of stuff, um, you're welcome to contact me. I'm going to start recruiting people to help me with research and things like that because um, it's really not a one-person job. We need like 50 people doing this. Um, so if you're interested in working with me on any of that, the other way that you can get involved is we have a campus sustainability committee um, that advises the chancellor and the campus on sustainability. And um, Elisa is actually one of our representatives on the main committee, but we also have subcommittees that look at academics and outreach um, in a lot of different areas. And you can get involved in those committees and get involved in sort of the administration side of what happens here on campus. But a lot of the change that's happened in the UC system, the UC sustainability policy, even the development of this committee, a lot of it was driven in part by student energy. Um, and there's really a lot that you can do while you're students here. So um, as an example, I don't know if anyone mentioned Bruins for Traffic Relief today. But um, this is a really exciting day for a lot of reasons, as far as election went. Um, 
But one of them is that uh, Measure R, which was a measure to fund transit here in Los Angeles, passed by about half of a percent. And yeah, and it was really close. And honestly, a big part of why it passed was because of student efforts here. There was a group that was organized called Bruins for Traffic Relief. And it was undergraduate and graduate students that came together and they organized rallies holding signs on Wilshire and they wrote editorials to get published in different papers and found ways to get the word out. And they actually ended up getting the attention of, of the city and of the people who were running Measure R and inspired them to campaign more. They hadn't actually done that much campaigning. And so because of what the Bruins for Traffic Relief did, um, the Measure R campaign started paying people to hold out signs and creating commercials and really campaigning for it. And if that hadn't happened, I really, it would not have passed, especially in this economy. So you can really have a seriously huge impact. I mean, this is a 30-year measure that'll be funding things for your children. So you can have a really big impact here as a student, and I hope that you'll get involved in any one of these great ways. Um, there's way too much to talk about in this short time, so I'll just say I now have an office, and you guys are all welcome to come and visit me, um, or call, or ask questions, or anything like that. So I'll put my info up on the board as well, and um, if anyone has any questions while I'm here, I'm happy to answer them. Thanks. Anybody questions before we move on to our fabulous lecture in environmental science? All right. Oh, yes. Where you, what are you looking to do as like your first task or goal? For Thanks. Um, well, it's a very interesting job because it really works with so many different areas on campus. But um, my biggest focus this year is really going to be on the strategic planning side. Because right now is a really exciting time for sustainability in UCLA. And people are doing things all over campus. But part of the problem is that a lot of people don't know what's going on. Both people who aren't involved haven't even heard that anything's going on. And people who are involved, you know, someone's doing something over here in the engineering school, but they don't know what the law school's doing, and they don't know what transportation's doing. And so bringing that all together and having a real vision of where we're going with this, I think, is really important. So I forgot to mention that the really big, exciting thing that's happening this year is um, the UC system has set forth goals um, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in the UC system. Um, there's a 2014 goal and 2020 goal, and then the eventual goal of being climate neutral. Um, so each of the campuses was required to create a climate action plan, and our campus has been working on one all year, and it's going to be released in December. So that'll be really exciting. And so I think this climate action plan will provide a foundation for broader campus sustainability plan. Um, and the first step is really to do an assessment and figure out where we are. We have a lot of data on energy, but there might be other areas that we haven't really looked at, like food, for instance. So I think hopefully within this year and next year, we can really figure out where we're at as a campus and set some concrete goals in each of these areas and then really be able to communicate how it all fits together. So that's my biggest thing. Um, but I'm happy to assist. You know, If you guys have ideas, however big, however small, bring them to me, bring them to TGIF and get them funded. Um, but let's get some of this stuff going. Thanks. Thank you, Nareet. Um, so a lot of things have been thrown at you guys today. You know, um, there's been a lot of people that have come up and talked to you. And we're not trying to, you know, brainwash you like a lot of those uh, the earlier kids were saying from uh, from high school, you know, in any sort of way. But we, but what we do want is for you to actively be thinking about this stuff in your life, to uh, and hopefully this class can be maybe, you know, that initiative that has gotten you to really start living what you're thinking about. And these are all different. About a year, year and a half ago now, um, I I decided. To that maybe this was something I was interested in, and I came out to E3. And I started going to some E3 meetings. I didn't go to all of them, but I just went to a few of them. And just being a part of that club and just actively thinking in my mind about what mattered to me is what set me down this path to really try to make a difference. And so I just really hope that if this is something that you guys are really passionate about, don't fully commit yourself. This is kind of what Tim was talking about a few weeks back, is you don't need to just completely jump into the circle. You know, take a step in, see how it feels, like adjust your life slowly but surely. 
And so just kind of think about, you know, how this could potentially affect you. Um, so we started with what high school students are doing today. We continued with what's going on on campus. Nareet just came in and she helped bridge the gap about telling of what faculty are doing here. And um, we're gonna end with Matthew Kahn, who is an environmental economist here at UCLA. And he is going to talk about other initiatives on campus coming from a faculty professor perspective. Um, so it's my great honor to introduce Professor Matthew Kahn. Hello. Folks, I'm, I'm delighted to be here, and I, I'd like to thank Michael for inviting me. That it's, um, I, 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 I've heard the last four speakers, and, I, and I'm very impressed, and I, I need to lower expectations. That, uh, I, but I, there, there's several things I'd like to tell you, and, and maybe we can have a discussion. So, Michael, how, how many hours have people been sitting here of, of this? This is like a dance hour marathon? Five so, an hour and five. Yeah. So, and, not. And we got so I, uh, so, 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 so a little bit about me, and I then want to talk a little bit about environmental economics, and I'll see if I can hypnotize all of you. I can, uh, I, uh, the, I'm an environmental economist. I'm at the Institute of the Environment, the Economics Department, and the Public Policy Department here at UCLA. I moved here a year and a half ago uh, from Boston, so, be, because California is where the action is. Uh, this is a very exciting time in environmental policy to be here. So I got my doctorate from the University of Chicago in economics. I then taught at Columbia University, then Harvard University, then Tufts University, then back to Stanford. I then went back to Tufts, and then I decided to come here. And after uh, listening to you guys, I may stay here a little longer. I, I would move every year if my wife would let me, because I, I get to know people, I learn their ideas, and then I tire of them, and I'm ready to move again. But, I, uh, but my wife and son love it here, and I love Los Angeles, and I also love UCLA. And so, and so a question I want to pose to everybody is, is, is Los Angeles a green city? And I said, no. The, uh, the, I published a book two years ago called Green Cities, Urban Growth and the Environment. And a professor-ish question I ask, and so of course I don't know the answer, but I have the right to pontificate for 200 pages, and it's just been translated into Chinese, uh, and I'm hoping into Persian soon, is, well, that that's, wasn't meant to be funny, the uh, <laughs> tough crowd, is, is Los Angeles a green city now? In, in the year 2050, will it be a green city? Are there actions that Mayor Villaraigosa can take, President Obama can take, uh, to make it a green city? Or is it up to the Starbucks, the Pete's, and the private sector to make it a green city? H how do we make a green city? Now let's go to Beijing. H has anyone been to Beijing recently? So uh, I'm hoping to give some lectures there this summer. My son and I watched the Olympics. Did, sir, did you, did, did you see green skies when you were there? And so we know that Beijing isn't green now. It's a rapidly developing place. Are there optimists in the room who think through, through activism, through technological advance, and through good choices, could Beijing be green in 42 years? And is this wishful thinking? Are we going to elevate the Pentagon next? Or is this, it was a joke, I, I, uh, the, uh, what, what confluence of events have to occur for Beijing to be green in 2050? These are some of the questions that I'm not going to be able to give you a five minute answer. I, if you allowed me to talk for a year, I could begin to sketch my answer. But in my uh, winter environmental economics course, this is one of the major themes we talk about. And there's many open questions for young researchers to work on. And so I am both a researcher and a teacher, and that's what all UCLA faculty do. And so I think there's synergies between the two. I am more excited about my teaching with undergraduates and graduate students when I'm excited about a research project that I'm doing. And I, in my remaining time, I'd like to tell you a little bit about that. I joined the UCLA Institute of the Environment because I'm convinced that environmental problems are interdisciplinary problems. That yes, economists are smart, clever people, but we can't make real progress on climate change mitigation and climate change adaptation unless we're talking to a variety of other scholars from engineering, 
uh, from the ecology department, from the geography department, from the law school, from the public policy school. And so I live a very interdisciplinary life, and that's what the Institute of the Environment is about. And I, uh, Michael, has the Institute been discussed today, or have we been invisible? I give up. The, and, and that needs to change. Wait, no. The, uh, the, the, the Institute of the Environment is both a research entity and, and a teaching entity and, and with a goal on campus of encouraging sustainability. And I wanted to give five different definitions of sustainability, uh, of, of how, as a nerd, I view this. And so I wrote, I wrote in my notes, is UCLA a green city? So, so do we have any optimists in the room? Uh, we got a B minus from, some, from someone. I've never gotten a B minus before. I'm kidding, I flunked out of pre-med. <laughs> d- did anyone see this ranking that we received a B minus from some? Victor, who gave us a B minus? Uh, sustainable. Yeah, the sustainable yeah, well, if you turn off the cameras, I will say what I think of that. The, Folks, as an, as, and I'm a statistician and I care about measurement. And so the two previous speakers made a number of fascinating points, which I will come back to in a couple of minutes. But when I think about UCLA and sustainability targets, I want to give five criteria for, to, to think about. And this is just food for thought in a fun talk, but I, I took Michael's invitation as an opportunity for me to introduce myself to you. And I don't know how often you get to see professors. Do any of you have a posters of us in your rooms? <laughs> we, well, I, uh, things have changed since I was a young man. The, uh, <laughs> so a first question is how do people, whether they're staff, faculty, or students, get to UCLA? I approached the parking office a year ago and wanted to know which faculty and staff had Hummers and which had Priuses. I wanted to do the following study. From administrative data, we all know where UCLA is, we're here. Uh, With administrative data on where everyone lives, I live in downtown Westwood next to the W, I'm there every night with my friends in the music industry. The, uh, the, uh, you could calculate every person's distance to UCLA. You then could ask, you could then superimpose the bus routes to see who lives close to public transit. I then, from the transit authority, wanted to know who's purchased a parking pass and what vehicle are they parking at UCLA. But the UCLA parking, and these guys are now friends of mine, we weren't friends at first, uh, but now we're working on a hydrogen project together and we're getting on better. Uh, They did not know what cars faculty and staff were parking in the parking lot because I wanted to offer a subsidy. The only idea in economics is that people respond to incentives. I wanted to offer a subsidy to people who park more fuel efficient vehicles in the parking lot. But they said, we don't know what people are parking. And I just said, ay, ay, ay. And so I wanted to calculate each UCLA faculty, staff, and students carbon footprint from transportation. So if Matt lives a mile from campus and takes a Prius or walks, very small footprint relative to somebody who lives in Orange County and commutes by Hummer here by him or herself. And it would have been possible to have measured this, but the data didn't exist to do this. I went berserk and they asked me to leave. And I I viewed this as a win-win. This research hadn't been done. Uh, And the truth hurts of, of let a thousand flowers bloom. Oh, and there would have been some funny stuff. I wanted to know by department, English professors versus business school professors, holding income, oh, we know everyone's in salary. Everyone's salary at UCLA is public information. Look up mine, it's very high. The, uh, uh, and so uh, from that information, you could say controlling for a professor's income, do those who are in more liberal departments have a smaller carbon footprint than those who are finance professors at Anderson? I wanted to write this paper, and I wanted to do some surveys on environmental ideology in perhaps survey questions, and then match that to whether they walk the walk in terms of their actual commuting behavior. But I wasn't allowed to do this, and I got angry. And Victor, did I take it out of my students? Thank you. And uh, Victor knows I believe in tough love, and you should meet my son. The, um, <laughs> the, the next question on my list is how you live at UCLA. And I actually don't know what that means. The, what I guess whoever wrote these points for me meant was 
in day-to-day -day life, do you carry your coffee mug of all the things we were just talking about with the recycled food? Of if I had a hidden camera behind Michael, is Michael walking the walk? Or when he goes to the bathroom, I, 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 does he flush the toilet 95 times? Does he take plastic styrofoam cups and turn them into a ball and shoot jump shots with them? Of, I, of how in the little things in life when we're not being watched, and where there's no social pressures and where there's no price incentive of how many sheets of toilet paper do you grab on the can when no one's watching. In the little things in life, what is your footprint when no one's watching versus when your friends are watching? Do you live your life differently? And that's actually been a theme that's interested me. Three, all on the topic on are we living a sustainable, is UCLA a green city? Three, how you interact with your friends and family while at UCLA. Has sustainability experiences like this led you to have different social interactions than you would have had? Have you confronted any of your non-vegetarian friends saying, what are you doing? Uh, and, and I can't say that I do that. I, I respect those who do, but I have a fear of conflict, having lost many fights as a younger man. <laughs> and and so, uh, so I'm very interested in environmentalism People, environmentalists, walking the walk themselves, but also sort of this, con this beneficial contagion in a sociological sense of trying to spread the word, it, it, not in proselytizing, but in educating others. And then as a person who's interested in measurement and cause and effect, if I tell Michael the benefits of recycling, there's a question, are professors important people? Would Michael nod to me and say, professor, you know, now that you've given me my grade, I don't care what you say. Uh, versus if I'm a focal person to Michael, my talking to him, you're spreading your information of what you've learned could, it's that old commercial, you, there's that shampoo commercial. She, he told two friends who told two friends and so on, of when can you set a, a, a beneficial contagion? Four, what you study at UCLA. Folks, are there any engineers in the room? It's possible, what, did I see half a hand? No hands, this is diversity. The, the <laughs> joke, the tenured <laughs> joke. Someone could drive a Hummer to UCLA every day, but if he or she came up with some algae that eats carbon dioxide, this person has added sustainability because they were at UCLA. And so there's fascinating issues of what you do with your education. I mean, of course, uh, I, I, you'd want to walk my whole checklist and be this engineer who comes up with the green Google. But, it, but it's an interesting issue of how you take the human capital you acquire here to go on and do great things in your career, which brings me to point five, what you do after UCLA. Well, it's intuitive that heading to a green piece is, is a green strategy. Part of me as a free market environmentalist would say the, the counterfactual, if you went to Exxon, and if you went on and got an MBA, and if you were an influential person in thinking through the future of some green technology, uh, one could actually have a greater environmental impact on the inside. Uh, and and it, of course this is on a case-by-case -case basis, but, uh, but I would challenge you to think this through. Folks, I wanna say three more things and then answer any questions. I want to tell you about a project we're trying to do at the Institute of the Environment related to one of the previous speaker's remarks. I'm very interested in the microeconomic question of are, are people really, do people really demand green products? So on surveys, if I went up to you and said, do you, do you want the ice cream that protects parakeets? Everyone's going to say yes to me as I come by, but the experiment uh, the, there's an experiment that Magali Delmas of the Institute of the Environment and I are trying to run. And is there anyone here from Pete's Coffee? Maybe I shouldn't have just said that word. We, we have been trying to run the following experiment in the real world. Suppose that Michael goes into a Pete's Coffee and is charged $1.60 for organic fair trade coffee. And he says, no thanks, I'll take the conventional coffee. We've just learned something about Michael's preferences. As an economist, here's the experiment I want to do. The next day, Michael goes into that Pete's, and Pete's is now charging $1.40, and Mike now buys the coffee. Does everyone agree we've just learned something about him as an environmental consumer? He wasn't willing to buy the green product, and Michael, I apologize. He wasn't willing to buy the product at $1.60. He was willing to buy it at $1.40. We've actually just gotten very tight bounds on his preferences. I haven't tortured him. I haven't tickled him. I haven't asked him. 
what we've done is he didn't even know that an experiment was going on. I will repeat myself since I sense some of you are awake. Michael walked into a store and he made a choice over a cup of coffee. Unbeknownst to Michael, I the next day have manipulated the prices on the board at the store. So for, if I had the strength, but because I'm tenured, I don't bother. At $1.60, he didn't buy it. At $1.40, so Pete's a company that works with me and Magali agrees to let us control the prices they charge to consumers. Mike is a marginal consumer. At $1.60, he was not willing to buy, but at $1.40, he was willing to buy. We've learned something about him because they allowed us to experiment. Now, notice the following. I said marginal, and you might say, what's the old guy talking about? So if Dick Cheney walked into this store, he might not buy this product if it sold for a penny. I, I, an, environmentalist, <laughs> an, an environmentalist would buy it no matter what the price was. Economists are interested in the group of consumers who, if they faced a different incentive for purchasing the green coffee, would change their behavior. And we call that the marginal group. Folks, this is crucial in terms of free market environmentalism. We want more solar panels. We want more people purchasing their power from renewable sources. We want more people driving Priuses. We want more people doing a whole range of green consumption. How are you going to make this happen? Are you going to pull out a baseball bat and threaten them with death? Are, are you going to regulate this? A free market solution that doesn't invade people's freedom would be the ability of companies, if they could price discriminate and run certain sales to try to capture certain segments, there'd be ways to increase the market share of green consumers. And the people at Anderson, some of whom like your ideology, but some of whom don't really care, would be much more interested in environmental students if they smelled that there were profit opportunities. And so I see win-wins here, and I'm always thinking about this. Folks, let me wrap up with a couple of thoughts. Several of you in the presentations I heard talked about different ways to encourage sustainability on campus. I'm a statistician, and I would ask each of you to think through, how do you know that the programs that you have pushed have been effective? So for example, the, uh, one program I, I heard before was this program uh, of confronting folks for how much food they're wasting. Folks, how would we know, I want to know what is your experimental design for knowing whether that's encouraging sustainability on campus? I've known some guys in my life who if you told them how much food they're wasting, they'd say, great, and would not be bugged at all. Implicitly, to believe that information about food wastage could cause people to change their behavior, you have to have a model in your head that people suffer from shame and ostracism. Uh, or guilt. You, oh, that was not meant as a joke, but that's a tough crowd. The, it, I want you guys, if, if I have any causal impact on having spent a half hour today, and I will send Michael a bill. The, um, it, a question is, how do you know what programs are effective? When environmentalists advocate something, is that warm glow, just to feel good, we're changing the world? I'd much prefer to feel crappy, am I still being taped? And, 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 and feel bad about myself, but know that my actions have had a causal impact on changing uh, the behavior of people. And that's why I act so crabby with my students. Uh, partially, they make me crabby with the things they say. But I, uh, but I am really trying to create a, a, a culture that is tough on itself of getting through wishful thinking and asking oneself what actions can really make a difference of getting these marginal individuals who currently aren't living a green life to live a green life. Folks are yawning at that. But how on campus, so let's do a couple of these to see if I've had any treatment effect here. Can someone name an incentive they'd like to introduce on campus to get us a greener UCLA? I don't want to make you pay per sheet of toilet paper. There's a question of how to make this happen. I'm willing to work the stalls. <laughs> My son would join me. Other incentives you have in mind to get us a greener campus? I, yes, sir. Uh, cheaper housing fees for students to go green. So, the, so there. I, I do agree with you. So give me an explicit policy of, of what you would do. Or... Uh, put a kind of a contract together with students who want to go green and sign with all the stuff that they do that would save the school money on energy costs. So let me follow up. I like your point. My colleague Magali Delmas is very interested in verification. 
So she would want to know if that young man signs this contract, does he just sign it, but that's cheap talk, and then he doesn't walk the walk. She's very interested in environmental accounting of how you verify that someone who says they're living a green life, so do you have a verification? We, we don't have a Gestapo. How, how would we double check that you are walking the walk? I need to figure that out. Ah, ah. yes. Well, like, you should figure out their, this would be kind of, kind of weird, but you could look at their electric bill. Nice. And like, make sure it's under a certain amount every month. So can I, I like that, and you've just come up with a way to link to hard statistics. Do we have any cynics in the room of how that, that could, if, if, if Matt knew that that's how he'll be judged, can I get around that, or, or that's airtight? Or I could go to my next door neighbors and use his light to read. Or, uh, uh, and that, that's, I've, I, and, 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 I, but I like the way you folks are thinking. And this is how an economist thinks. How do we create accountability mechanisms to get better behavior? I don't trust individuals. For example, I thoroughly support the Internal Revenue Service auditing people to see if they paid their taxes. I don't believe people honestly pay their taxes, regardless if they're Democrat or Republican. They need to have the fear that there's going to be an audit in this case, an energy audit. So I would take your idea, but I would tell the undergraduates and graduates, there's a 5% chance that Nareet may show up with her green Gestapo. And if they catch you out of compliance, exceeding your stated electricity bill, there's a question of what would be a credible threat? Could we kick you out of UCLA or you'd have to get a tattoo of Dick Cheney on your back? <laughs> and, so I, and so there's some equivalency here of punishment. Folks, give me another incentive. So, so interesting, so, so my parking's always been guaranteed. Tell me about you. And so I actually just gave up my spot. So students are in a lottery? Yeah. And so that is interesting. And so I, and I do like that. And from, yes, is, is there an unintended consequence of that policy? I can't think of one. There's a question of guarantee. It costs UCLA $10,000 to build per parking spot. And they, they might be worried that they, if they credibly made that promise, they might have to build a lot more spots. Um, one of the issues might be that uh, certain um, communities that can't afford to buy a more fuel efficient vehicle uh, would then be limited from getting the parking spot. It's a nice point. And so there are, there are, unfortunately, there are cases where environmental justice goals collide. Perhaps a bus subsidy, a free bus pass would be a way if you bundled that with this uh, to, to mitigate that concern. Folks, so you guys are better than I am. Give me two more before I need to lie down. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, a one to one ratio of landfill bins, recycling bins, and compost bins on campus. So, what's the status quo? Of, or there, there's, there's, there's like So walk, walk me through the economics of this. If we introduced your proposal, what, who, whose behavior would be changed? There's some dude with a, with, who, what good things happen for the environment with that? So you've lowered the price to be green. And, so, and so that's what an economist, and so I agree with you. If we talk to facilities management, how would they push back? Would they say there's a fixed cost to buying these things and our dudes don't want to unload all these things? It, I, and so that would be the trade-off if you were in facilities management. But your point is well taken. Are there unintended consequences of her proposal? It would facilitate greenness on campus, but it, it's rare to find a free lunch. But, it, but I agree with her point that it, it offers environmental benefits. Well, let's do one more. My nap is approaching. Yes. 5% uh, discount for students that are going to be people that I prefer to students at the end of the store, like how this goes on Tuesday. So a question there, and I would support that. Whose revenue would decline? You see, when you buy something at a UCLA store, who gets the money? It's UCLA. So UCLA would be effectively making a 5% transfer to students who use these bags. They would have to do something other bags. Good. And so you're thinking like an economist on the trade-off, and, and so that that's what I'd want Gene Block to be thinking through. If, if Gene Block were here, it, can someone think of a pushback he would make? Someone might say if there's a poor student that this is an extra, 
So there's an incidence question here. Would UCLA stores raise their price 5% to cover this? Uh, and so that's a question from intermediate micro. But, but, but I do like your point of, so are there any poor students who don't have the money to afford this? But, uh, but I, I take your point. So folks, let me wrap up since I see I've overstayed my welcome. <laughs> There's a question how we get a green LA, a green China. One hope if you ignored the economists is through education, sort of hand-to-hand -hand combat. So how many students, there's a big crowd here. Uh, there's more people than I expected. But how many students are there at UCLA? Aren't there like 35,000? One could wait for this room to grow to be 35,000. And then we say, man, we're in the majority. Gene Block's going to listen to us. Uh, that might take a while. Uh, an alternative strategy would be to continue to think through as, as one works with facilities management, with companies in the real world, uh, in the private sector, I should say. This is the real world. Uh, I've lived in the academic sector my whole life. Uh, a question of how we set up incentives to change people's behavior. If we think there's too much pollution now, how do we get less pollution? Do we shut down the factories or do we incentivize them to green themselves and to take another look at their business as usual operations? And the win-win to many economists of how to green capitalism is to incentivize the Montgomery Burns from the Simpsons of the world to get us a greener nuclear plant. And so I, I will close with Blinky the three-eyed fish. And so I uh, uh, think of him. And let's see if someone can get an A in my class. Uh, why does he exist? D did Montgomery Burns just want to hurt the people of Springfield? Well, that's a correct answer, but I don't know what the word means. So, so what, what has he done? He's stolen from the people of Springfield. What creates a three-eyed fish? You're going to say Mother Nature? And so, and, and so why did Montgomery Burns create the pollution? He could. There was no incentive not to. There was a zero. Montgomery Burns has to hire Homer Simpson. He has to hire his henchman, whose name escapes me. He has to pay for the capital of the nuclear plant, Mr. Smithers. But he, when he pollutes the water, as I guess as he cools his plant and he dumps nuclear runoff into the water, he doesn't have to pay for that in the absence of regulation or incentives. Facing a zero price, anyone would engage in too much activity. If you're at a bar and I tell you the price of beer is free, you're going to drink too much. And so the, 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 to an economist, there's no difference between drinking pizza or polluting. To get this Montgomery Burns to not pollute the local river, he needs to face an incentive. The statistician would then ask, big potatoes versus small potatoes. If you face this incentive, if Montgomery Burns faced a $200 per unit tax, how much would he reduce his pollution by? And that's up to the statistician, just like in that example with Michael. when I when he was randomly exposed to a 20 cent reduction in organic coffee's price, he all of a sudden bought it. That was sufficient incentive, 20 cents, to change his behavior. And that's what economists do. Michael, have I disappointed you? I never do. <laughs>
I want you to say, that's me. That's me. All right. Now, if your right thumb is the one on top, I want you to say, that's me. OK, so we got about half and half. And if your left thumb's on top, it means you're a little bit smarter, by the way. I'm just, just told a joke. No. Um, I want you to take your thumbs and go like this and cross them, OK? So whichever one's on top. And then realign your fingers accordingly. All right? I don't like it? Wait. It's weird. <laughs> what'd, you, what'd you say? Is that uncomfortable? It's kind of weird, huh? All right, well, here, just take your thumbs, put them back. Put them back, get nice, all oh, nice and like, we're back and comfortable. So why would we want to do that? Why would we want to like put our hands all weird like that? And it feels like we're like holding some stranger's hand. Like, <laughs> we would want to do that because um, that's how we learn about ourselves, or that's how we learn in general. So when we're here like this and we're in a comfortable state, um, you know, we're kind of at home, we're chilling, we're watching TV, we're on the couch. We don't really learn a lot, but when we go like this and we get into like an uncomfortable place, and that could be, you know, taking the bus if you've never took the bus, you know, or, or that could be going a whole day without like eating meat or so, or something like that, or you know, it could be, uh, you know, saying hi to, to like strangers. Maybe you don't usually do that. I do, but um, so that's that's kind of relates. Uh, so I want you to go go back to this again, but now I want you to like create like a tight fist, and then like. Um, like smash yourself right in the nose as hard as you can, OK? No, nobody, <laughs> he knew that I was going to do that. Nobody did it. Nobody did it. Why? Because it, it's, it, it's going to hurt, right? So you <laughs> Yeah, well, this ties in directly to uh, what Professor Khan was saying. And um, yeah, it's basically. Um, you know, if I told you that I had like a million dollars in that podium and first person to draw blood, we'd have a couple bloody noses in here for sure. <laughs> for sure, we'd have a couple bloody noses. So that gets that brings us exactly to what, what Professor Khan was saying. We need to have some sort of incentive, you know, whether it's a monetary incentive or whether it's peer pressure or, you know, um, because we know, um, you know, because we know that that what we do affects what happens in the next 20 years, the next 30 years, or the next 2,000 years. Um, so we need to have an incentive um, So in order to create change. And then the next part of this activity, I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat. I'm going to ask you to find a partner, somebody who you do not know their first name. Okay. So there has to be somebody in this room who you do not know their first name. So I want you to find that person. And when you do, just... Um, Okay, I'll give you. Don't introduce. You don't need to introduce yourselves just yet. Just find somebody real quick. Okay, okay, okay. All right. Can you guys be quiet? Can you guys be quiet for a second, please? Okay. So everyone has a partner. Does anyone not have a partner? Um. I. Okay. That's fine. That's cool. All right. I want you. What I want you to do. You know. After you, of course, exchange names. Um, look at your partner for. It's going to be about 30 seconds. I'm going to ask you to just kind of visually inspect your partner up and down. Okay. <laughs> Not. Is that just okay? And then. And then wait a second. And then you're going to turn back to back. All right. And I'm going to give you about a minute. And I'm, you're going to have to make five changes to your physical appearance. Okay. So. So just look your partner up and down real quick, and then turn back to back, and make five changes to your physical appearance. No. Like, like physically, like hold my hands or something. I don't. It's up to you, man. Okay. So if you go back to back. Go. Okay. Turn back to back, guys. Come on. I'm even doing this too. Yeah, back to back, back to back, back to back with your partner. Okay, all right, so now I want you to. Uh, 
turn back and face your partner and try to identify five, those five changes. All right. Change that side of your shirt. It's two. Inside your shoes. Uh. I don't see. This right here. Yeah, okay. And then my sock, I rolled it over. Okay. Okay. This is something you learned at uh. Challenge for. Okay. All right. Have you guys have you guys identified the five changes? Wow, it's a talkative bunch. Okay. Okay. I want you to turn turn back to back again. Don't change don't change any of those changes back. Okay. You have to turn back to back again and make five additional changes. You can't change it back. There's got to be five new changes. No whining. Come on. Five more. You guys can do this. Are you UCLA students? Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what it is. Then so. All right, now turn back around and try to identify those five changes. You got to be fast. This is just a fast. You got to be on your toes, people. All right. You stuck to your shoes. You got ISIS shoes. Yeah. Okay. You tucked your thing in and you put. You took your watch off. Did you do this? Did you that, was, that was the first time. Okay. So one, two. What else? I took okay. my watch off and I have it over here. Okay, what about me? Uh, I took off your shoes completely. You lifted that set up. And you brought those keys from somewhere. Mm -hmm. And then you did that side. Yeah. Okay. 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 Now I want, I want, now I want you to make turn it back around and like I make five more changes. These are gonna be the last ones, new ones. Five, just five more. Come on, you can do it. It's not that hard. <laughs> All right. All right, so turn back around and see if you can identify those last five changes. All right, the shoe. Keys. Shoe, you take the other shoe off. New watch. New watch. Oh, wow. You're getting all kinds of stuff. All right, I think we're good. I feel like there's something. All right. Nice, this is fun. It is. I can't wait to get the moral of the story now. OK. This is going to be good. You got to tell me the moral. It's going to be good. No, I can't. I can't. I'm on my phone. Okay, so if you've identified if you've identified those five changes, you can you can sit back down in your seat. Yeah. You guys can sit back down uh, now, and I'm gonna tell you what this all means because I know you're wondering. Okay. All right, you guys can take a seat so we can wrap things up. All 
All right, you can and you can you can change you can make you can change back to your normal state of being, um, except uh, if you can if you want to keep one change for the rest of the day, I would encourage you to keep just one change. That wouldn't be too hard. Um, now I want to ask you guys, who thought like the first five changes were the hardest to make? One or two, couple hands. Okay. What about the second five changes? There was some groaning involved, like, uh. What about the last five changes? Yeah. Everyone thought the last five, did anyone think the last five changes actually were easier? Really? Okay, I want to hear why. Okay. Okay, anybody else? Exactly. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Anybody else? Michael? You just have to get out of your shell for some of our life. Okay. Well, you know, it's, it's good to see we're all friends here. So, so, um, so we find that, um, did you? Well, there's just some changes you don't even realize you can make. It's not like you don't want to, it's just you didn't even think uh -huh. about it. Yeah. I guess you get more comfortable with the person you're working with. Like, That's true, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's everything that you guys said is, is, is exactly it. I mean, I don't need to explain. Um, go ahead. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and then people are pretty pretty helpful, right? People are giving each other shoes and watches, and I hope you guys got all your stuff back. Um, <laughs> but but everyone seemed to be real helpful, and I think that that is 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 just kind of a a good analogy to in terms of what we're trying to do, and in terms of like basically how um, how to make change. It's pretty. It's not that hard, you know. Um, especially step by step, and you get a little bit more comfortable. And um, so, I, and uh, to, to close, because I think we're getting out of time, I wrote a little something about change, because um, I thought today was, um, what? Can I go first, and then? Okay, I'm going to just read this, because today for me was, was really um, a historic day, and um, you know, in terms of change and progress uh, throughout history. So. Uh, it said, change is clearly at hand. The first time election of an African-American president to the United States of America is a truly transformational moment, which helps give context and legitimacy to the movement we are in. Although this change is monumental, you can see change all over the world, and even in your backyard. It can be seen in the formation and progress of student groups, um, Environmental Charter High School, um, you know, E3, CSSC, Net Impact, um, it can be seen with the appointment of a student regent who's extremely socially progressive, like D'Artagnan Scorza, who had come speak in our class. Um, whether it's as large as a presidency or, or as, as large as a state ballot for, for high-speed rail, or whether it's as small as changing a light bulb. The world is changing, and we're driving that change. So however, it is important to not forget that all of us need some guidance, and that there are many of us who are resistant to change or fear for the future. So it is our responsibility as students and as agents of change to shine a light for those who cannot see and to speak up for those who cannot hear and to hold a hand for those that cannot feel. Long and deep rooted are traditions and bonds of fear and hate all over the world we w which we must break if we are to prosper in the years to come. So I relish this day and I hope you do too for it gives me hope and it gives me faith that the possibility of the human spirit and the unity for which we strive shall guide us towards a better world. Hey, guys. You guys probably know what we're going to say. Oh, did you want to? Yeah, we're just going to be real brief. I know we're running late. But uh, so thank you all who came last time for the film series. Um, next screening is. Tuesday night, 7 p.m., Sproul as usual. The movie is Good Food. It's about sustainable agriculture systems in 
Thank you. It's about sustainable agriculture systems in the Pacific Northwest, Portland area. And wow. Haley will tell you about something very cool that's coming up for this one. I like the microphone. Um, so we have something really exciting this week. So if you guys didn't come before because you like don't like movies or whatever, it's different. We're having a speaker come afterwards. It's actually he's actually being brought by the Sustainability Floor RAs in Sproul, and um, his name is Sale Rash or Salesh uh, Rao, and he worked with Al Gore and he founded a nonprofit called uh, Climate Healers, and he's working to reforest low-income areas. Um, and also to provide low-income people with uh, free solar panels and pay them to use them. So we have a really cool business model that he's going to talk about. So if you guys have time, we'll probably talk for like an hour. Like that's right after the movie, so about nine to ten. Same place, Sproul Fire Fair, Sproul <coughs> Lecture Hall. So you guys should come to the movie, dessert, and then stick around for the next little bit. Yeah. Oh, and Isis will be bringing dessert as usual. And we'll play play a play a preview of it, but you guys can leave just in case. Yeah. Yeah, you guys can leave. You want to kind of walk in. Do you have anything else? In case you like, are on the fence whether you're going to come or not, and we'll see the preview. Okay. So Please come tonight at eight to nine at my house. Yeah, eight to nine art meeting tonight tomorrow. at Isis's apartment. Thank you. Have a great day. Stay